Hey guys, welcome back. So today, working on this Troybilt generator. Uh, this was one of two pieces of equipment that Kyle donated to the channel. Uh, the other was a snowblower, which I'll make a video on when things cool down a bit. But for today, I thought I would turn my attention to this generator. Uh, this was given to him as payment for a job he did, and he was told the engine ran and it made power. Anyway, fast forward to the next power outage, he started it up, connected it to his house, and found there was no output from this generator. So, you know, I think he put it in the corner. It's been, I think, a couple years since it's been started. So I think I'm going to start there. I'm going to check the oil real quick, see if we have any fuel in the tank, try to start it, and see what that engine sounds like. And of course, we'll double check if there is, in fact, no output from this machine. All right, let's see what we have in here. You don't think we're gonna have any surprises because we actually have the elusive oil sensor on this model. So we've got plenty of oil. You know, it does need to be changed. But I think we'll let it earn its oil change. And the fact that it has an oil sensor kind of dates this as well. The newer Briggs do have oil sensors, but those are Honda clones. On the actual Briggs engines, they had the oil sensor up until about 2004, 2005. So that kind of dates this engine. You know, we can double check the date in a bit. Uh, but that's a good thing, actually. That is something you want on a generator. So I'm not sure why Briggs ever got rid of this. You can actually see the casting on the newer engines, but it was never drilled out. And of course, the oil sensor was never installed. And let's see what we have in the tank. You know, I didn't hear any fuel sloshing around, so hopefully it was drained. And it looks like it was. Tank is nice and clean. So rather than filling it up, you know, for testing, I don't like doing that because then I have a bunch of generators sitting around with fuel and people don't use generators that often. So I like to keep the tank dry, especially a plastic tank. So I'm gonna remove the fitting, the connection here to the carburetor and we'll just feed it some fuel externally and we'll try to start it. So we'll just get the clamp out of the way. And I like to use these hose pliers just to twist the line back and forth. A lot of times they stick to the fitting and you gotta break them free. And of course I can use these to pull the line off, uh, but being that this is a plastic fitting, you know, I don't like applying that much force. So what I often do is just use a screwdriver to kind of pry it up slowly. And I find that is a bit safer than just trying to rip it off with the fuel line pliers. And of course the safest way is just to cut it off. You know, if it's really petrified and you know, this line might qualify, but let's give it a try. Yeah, that's really on there. Yeah, I think this one's gonna have to be cut. We'll cut it. Let's turn the choke on, ignition on. The carburetor, I did feed it some fuel and the good news is it took fuel and it stopped right about there. So the needle and seat they are working and the float seems to be working as well. So that is a good sign. I've got the multimeter connected as well to measure the AC output. And I've got two lights plugged into each leg. So ideally I would start this engine and if everything's working properly, we would see 120 volts output on that multimeter and both lights turn on. So let's give it a pull and see what happens.
confirmed. There is no output from this generator, or at least nothing usable. The highest voltage I saw on that multimeter was 0.9 volts AC. And of course that could not turn on these lights. You need quite a bit more voltage. So there is a problem for sure with that power head. You know, on the bright side though, the engine, it sounded good. Uh, the carburetor though, not so happy. I did have to choke the engine almost all the way to get the engine up to speed. And as soon as I turned the choke off, it just went to stall. So the carb needs to be cleaned, uh, not a big deal, uh, but I'm not gonna worry too much about that until we get to the bottom of what's going on with this power head. So the lift table, it is in use. So I think for now, I'm just gonna get the end cover off the power head. We'll take a quick visual look, see if we see any signs of a problem and get the multimeter out, run some tests and see if we can't get to the bottom of what's wrong with this generator. It's just a side note here, this power head, it's a very well-built power head. I've never seen one fail, or at least not on a storm responder. And this looks to be exactly the same design as a power head on a storm responder, which I have right here. So the only time I've seen one of these fail is when someone actually bypassed the circuit breaker and just ran the generator overloaded for too long until it caused a meltdown. So I'm hoping we're just gonna find a bad bridge rectifier. The diodes do commonly go bad, so with any luck, that is what we're dealing with. Anyway, let's get that off and see what we see. Right, the big reveal. Things are actually looking pretty good. If you look in there, you can see the lacing. It doesn't look overheated. It's not broken. Some of the wires are dark in color, but I know for a fact that Briggs does use dark varnish on some of their stators. So I would not say that that is a red flag. So things actually look pretty healthy in here. And it looks like it uses the same brush bridge rectifier assembly that's used on the storm responder. And I'm willing to bet one of these diodes is bad. So I'm gonna get this brush assembly off. We'll test it with the multimeter and see if we can't find a fault. Forgive the mess. I'm actually in the middle of rebuilding another Briggs. That's why my workbench is full of stuff and my lift table. This one ran out of oil because the oil sensor was never installed. This should be machined out. There should be wires coming down and the sensor installed right here. So yeah, that's something you don't see in their engines from 2006 forward at least not until they switched to the Honda clones. So if you have an engine like that with no oil sensor, I tell people just check the oil, you'll be fine. They're actually very good engines, but you have to check the oil. And you could theoretically put an oil sensor in there, but the last time I looked, the parts, they were not available. Even if they were, it was over a hundred bucks. And I think it would actually be cheaper just to buy a generator that has an oil sensor to begin with. Anyway, back to testing this. So this is the assembly I just pulled out. And actually before I test that, I kind of want to go over what a diode does and how to test it. So you do need a multimeter with the diode function. And the idea of a diode is that it only allows current to flow in one direction. And if you look closely, you can see on the right side there is a line painted. And that's indicating where the negative is allowed 
to go through or the positive allowed to go through, depending upon, you know, who you are or who you ask. Anyway, that's a story for a different time. But the idea is if you hook negative on the side with the stripe and positive on the other, you should get a voltage drop as the current goes through the diode. And in this case, we're getting no voltage drop. So, oh, there we go. Must have had a loose connection. Yeah, so 0.488. So that looks correct. So we'll get this off. We'll hook it up in the other direction. So we'll put positive on the side with the stripe and negative on the other side. And in this case, we should get no voltage drop. So this diode, it is functioning properly. And that's really the main purpose of diodes in this application. So this is a full bridge rectifier, which basically means it accepts AC in, and it's going to output DC to the brushes. So if you put positive to this terminal, positive is always output on the positive brush, no matter which tab you connect that positive to. And same thing with negative. So that's the negative brush. No matter how you hook up the polarity on these top two tabs, negative is always going to come out there. So before we test this one, I'll show you how to test a known good one. Again, it doesn't matter which tab we use because the full bridge rectifier will always send the negative down to the negative brush, which yeah, in this case they are broken off, but I know the electronics are good. So if I connect that right here, we should get a voltage drop, which we do. And the other side, we get no voltage drop. So that is correct. And if I switch over to here, we're going to see exactly the same thing. If that'll stay on. We should get a voltage drop here and not there. So that's correct. And then we want to try the opposite. So that way we know all the diodes are good. And you do need to test both tabs, again, to test all the diodes. So now we're sending positive through. Should go to the positive brush, which it does. Not the negative brush. So we know that is good. And we'll do the same test over here. Starting with the positive brush. We get the drop. That's good. And nothing over there. So we know all these diodes are functioning properly. Now, we'll do the same test on the one we just pulled from the generator. We'll just start with the negative up on either one of these tabs. And then we'll touch the positive brush, which I believe was that one. And that just dropped to zero. So we actually have a dead short somewhere. And if I touch it over here, same thing. So we definitely have a diode issue here. One or more of these diodes are bad. Let's check from that terminal. That actually looks good. Hmm. Actually, it doesn't. The negative brush should be this one. That's where we should see the voltage drop. And we're actually seeing it on both brushes. So yeah, not good. Let's try sending positive through. Should get a drop on the positive brush. Dead short. Dead short on both brushes. So yeah, not looking good. I think we have multiple diodes failed here. Voltage drop. Voltage drop. Yeah, this one's not behaving. There is definitely something wrong here. So, you know, this one, it could be fixed. I mean, we just need new diodes. But... I actually have another one without broken brushes that I believe is good. Let me grab that. We'll test that real quick. So let's see how this one tests. We'll just do the same thing. Start with one of these terminals. Check the negative brush. And we should see a voltage drop if I actually had it in the right setting. So negative brush, voltage drop. Positive brush, no drop, so we're good there. We'll check from this tab, same test. We should see voltage drop. 
nothing there, which is good. Now we'll do positive to the positive brush. We should see a voltage drop and we do. Nothing on the other brush, so that is perfect. And we'll check the other tab here to the positive brush. We see a voltage drop and nothing there. So this is definitely a good brush rectifier unit. So let's plug this one in and see what we get. So a couple things you need to keep in mind when getting these brushes reinstalled. I guess first is note where that tab is. That has to face in. If you do it the other way, you're gonna reverse the polarity on the rotor and your generator most likely is not gonna power up like that. Now in this case, it may not power up anyway because when the diodes failed on the other bridge rectifier, it would have sent AC into the rotor and this rotor in particular relies on residual magnetism. There are no permanent magnets and most likely that magnetism got scrambled. So even though I'm plugging in a part that works, we may actually have to flash the field to get power output. Anyway, I'm gonna reconnect this the same as it was with the red wire on the top. It shouldn't matter because this is AC going in. So the bridge rectifier will take care of the rest as long as you install it the right way. It is tempting to use power tools on this, but you don't want to do this. It's a very small fine thread bolt. You will strip out the aluminum in a second. Ask me how I know. All right, let's add a little fuel, get this topped off. That should be good. Uh, this time I've got the lights reconnected. They are still turned on. And instead of the multimeter, I've got a drill here. You know, I think residual magnetism is gonna be an issue. So I'm not expecting those lights to turn on. And if they don't turn on and the engine doesn't sound like it's going under load or nothing blows out on that new bridge rectifier, I'm going to flash the field. And in this case, I'm using a drill. I can just hold the trigger down and spin the chuck. This acts as a generator and it sends some voltage into the stator, which helps excite the system. By sending some power in there, you're creating magnetic fields, and a lot of times that can be enough to give things a kickstart and get that bridge rectifier powered up to power the rotor, and then we'll quickly ramp up to full power. So let's give it a try. It didn't exactly go as planned. I was hoping to get the power to come on. We didn't see that. And I can't say I'm that surprised. I've had a lot of issues getting these to come back. You gotta flash it quite a few times with the drill. So I think I'm gonna try it again. I'm gonna refuel, get it started again. This time I'm gonna leave these lights unplugged. I've actually already unplugged them because that is 140 watt load. And on a generator that has lost magnetism, that's really fighting us as far as getting it to come back. 
So instead, I've made a return of the bubble light. That only uses a few watts, and that'll give us a good visual indicator if we get any power output. So I'm gonna get it restarted. We'll spin the drill and see if that light comes on. back here again. Unfortunately, the carb is now failing us. So without the engine up to speed, trying to flash it with a drill is nearly impossible. And, you know, I've had a lot of trouble flashing these power heads with a drill and getting him to power up. It is possible, but it takes a while. And there is another approach, which is easier if you have what I have. And most people don't, which is why I started with the drill. Anyway, what I do have is a set of brushes without the bridge rectifier. So I'm gonna connect these up. We'll get some leads on here. And I'm just gonna apply 12 volts directly without the engine running. I'm sure the manual says it should be. Honestly, I can't see why you would need to because you just wanna send power into the rotor to basically turn on the electromagnet. That's what the rotor is. That'll restore hopefully enough magnetism so that when I reinstall this, it'll power up on its own. Actually, before I flash the field with 12 volts, Let's just check the resistance on the DPE winding and the slip rings. Now, I don't suspect we're gonna find a problem because this generator was making power when it blew out those diodes. So on a DPE, we should have around 1.5 ohms. And that's what we see. I'll just remove one of the leads. We'll check it to ground. We should get nothing and we get nothing, so that is a good sign. Next, we'll check the slip rings. Uh, this rotor is pretty low resistance. I think in the 20 to 30 ohm range. And we had a reading for a second. Yeah, there we go, 23. That looks fine, we'll check it to ground. No connection to ground. So yeah, things are looking good. All you need to make power is a good DPE winding and a good rotor. And that should power up the rotor and send power to the stator. Now, if the stator was bad, you would then have a meltdown. But given we have a good DPE and a good rotor, it should be trying to power up. So I think we're still on the right track here. It has to be residual magnetism. So let me get these brushes connected. We'll flash the field and then switch back to the other brushes, see if it powers up on its own.
So I was just double checking with the multimeter that we do have a good connection through the brushes, and we do. It's about 39 ohms. I've also added a five amp automotive fuse because these leads are very thin. They can't handle many amps. Now, if everything's working correctly, it really shouldn't pull more than two amps. So I think we'll be okay with that five amp fuse. I've got the yellow wire connected to the positive brush and the black wire to the negative. So we'll connect this to battery negative, the black wire. And we're gonna hold the yellow to the positive for about, I would say about five seconds. That should be enough. No sparks, so that's a good thing. And we got a spark when we pulled it off, that's normal. That's just the field collapsing, sending some power back. Okay, I'm gonna connect up the bridge rectifier and we'll try this again. What do you think? Is it gonna work this time? I hope so. So similar test, hopefully the carb has enough in it to start one more time. The bubble light is plugged in and turned on. I've got these two lights plugged in, but they're turned off. So assuming we can get the engine started and the bubble light comes on and we can keep the engine running, I'll try to get those turned on and maybe we'll be home free. Let's find out. Ignition's on, choke's on. There we go, the bubble light, it came on. We just needed a little help to get the engine speed up. So it makes me wonder if flashing it with the drill may have worked. You know, the engine speed may not have been going fast enough to get what we needed to generate power. You know, regardless, I saw that light come on, so I think we're home free. We just need to clean up that carb. You know, that said, I'm gonna try it one more time. Uh, this time with the lights turned on. We'll give it a couple squirts once it's started to keep it going and just see that it can support a load, which I think it's gonna do without issue. I think it's safe to cross no power off the list. It's consistently making power at least twice in a row. We had no issues with those lights powering up. They are on different legs. Of course, the bubble light turned on as well. The issue really is that carb now. It is not running the engine at all. So that is the next move here. You know, thankfully, it was just a bad bridge rectifier that ended up scrambling that residual magnetism. So if you get into a pinch like this, where even though you put a new part in, and it's still not making power. If it's a generator like this without an AVR, then you may need to flash the field. You know, in this case, I know that this didn't have permanent magnets on the rotor. A lot of newer generators, the ones with AVRs, actually do have permanent magnets on each side of the rotor. So you can't lose residual magnetism. And if your generator has an AVR or it was manufactured in the last 20 years, chances are it does have an AVR, then this approach may not work. I mean, it might get it going, but if it didn't power up on its own with permanent magnets in there, then there's a bigger problem. You know, in this case, I've fought with these before. I know they don't have magnets and residual magnetism definitely becomes an issue when 
these blow out like this one did. Anyway, that's behind us. I say we move on, get the carb off, and get it cleaned up. Actually, before I get that carb cleaned up, I just want to take a second and explain a little better and show how the rotor works. There's really not much to it. And actually, before I get into this, let's just talk about how power is made in the first place. You only need two things, a coil of wire and a magnet moving near that coil of wire. So in this case, the coil of wire is the stator and the rotor is the magnet. Now, it's not a permanent magnet, at least not on the one that we just fixed. And this one does have a small permanent magnet, but that's only to make it impossible to lose residual magnetism. You're always going to have a little bit of magnetism right there. And by having that little bit of magnetism, that's how you can get this to power up. When you start the engine, the little magnet or the residual magnetism, it creates a bit of current in the stator, which sends a little bit to the slip rings and a little bit to the electromagnet. And the process quickly amplifies, like less than a second, you go from no power to full power if everything's working correctly. You know, in this case, of course, we're not going to have that problem, but for demonstration, if I try to stick it anywhere else besides right there, it doesn't stick. And if we give the rotor some power, we're now creating an electromagnet. And we can stick bolts to it, although that one doesn't want to stick, but you can see it's trying. And then if I dial the power back, the bolts fall off because the magnetic field has collapsed. You know, that said, there is still a slight magnetic field here, and that's what's needed to start a generator generating power. Anyway, let's move on and get that carb cleaned up. I cleared the other project off the lift. It's waiting on parts anyway, and this has earned its spot up here. And I think it's also due for its promised oil change. It's filled up right to the top. There's no need to actually check the dipstick. If you can see that oil right up to the last thread, then you're good. And as far as the oily mess goes down here, just a bit of WD-40 and this stuff will wash right off. I got a little sidetracked cleaning up the oily mess on the other side. So I kind of kept going. You know, we still need to do some spots like the top of the tank. I was cleaning up pretty well. You know, the chrome has a good shine on it. A lot of the dust wiped off and there's plenty of good paint underneath. And the real good news is that the oil that came out, besides just being well used, there's nothing in there that shouldn't be. There's no bits of metal, no debris. So... Yeah, things are looking pretty good on this engine. Anyway, let's finally get this carb off, get it cleaned up and finish this thing up. It's not a good sign. There's a lot of what looks to be varnish maybe corrosion. But it 
came out. Actually doesn't look half bad. It looks like a little bit of oil came out of the breather. And I think that's what I was seeing. No corrosion in the throat of the carb. So that actually is a good sign. So to get the carb off, it's just these two more bolts right here. And then of course, remove the linkage and we should be home free. kind of going back and forth. Don't want to push it too far in any one direction because it is threatening to break. Wow, that one was in there. Kind of an odd place for the low oil sensor, or actually the module, that sensor's in the engine, this is what provides the delay shutting down the engine. And once it starts the shutdown, it shuts the engine down. Anyway, it is attached, it is in the right spot. And this is the bolt that was fighting me. It doesn't actually look bad. I mean, I do see a little bit of white powder right there. So I'm gonna quickly brush that with a wire wheel and just try threading it back in. I wanna make sure that we're not gonna have any issues here. Yeah, I think we'll be fine. The bolt, it is bottomed out right now, which is not an issue because we do have a spacer and the thickness of the carburetor. So yeah, there's just a little corrosion in the threads kind of locking this one pretty tight. It seems to be fine now. All right, we'll get that fuel line off. This carb, it's a very simple carb and I know it's not a complete mess since it worked a little bit. We know the needle and seat work, the float works. Really, it's the main jet. And on this carb, the, the nut 
or the bolt that holds the bowl on is also the main jet. So we definitely need to clean this. Not bad, actually. Pretty clean, a little bit of debris. Potentially a bit of water. Let's get the pin out. And now we can get the float with the needle out. Needle looks to be in pretty good shape. And that's pretty much it. The emulsion tube on this carb, it is not removable. You know, we do have a seat, a rubber seat down there that I do need to be careful of because the cleaner I use in the ultrasonic, the Harbor Freight Super Heavy Duty Degreaser, tends to shrink rubber. So I'm not going to go crazy with the concentration. You know, I don't want to cause an issue because that seems to be functioning. I think the main focus here is going to be just cleaning out this jet, getting the bowl clean, and just going through the passages, make sure we don't have any blockages. And then I'll let it soak for a bit just to clean it up on the outside as well as the in. And then we should be good to go. There really, really is not much to this carb. So let's check this guy. No issue there. No issue there either. So that is interesting. It would only run on full choke and that main jet was not clogged, the emulsion tube not clogged. So yeah, potentially just a bit of debris was blocking the main jet, but didn't have it plugged solid. Or maybe we have bigger issues on the carb. I'm not sure which it is. All right, let's just finish this up. We'll bolt it back on, see if it runs any better. Yeah, I think I forgot to show you what came out of that carb. Really not too bad, a little bit of debris. You know, I think some of that may have been in the cup to begin with. So yeah, I mean, really not much in there. Makes me wonder. Just get the main jet in this T-ball or really any smaller part that you don't want to lose. Carb cleaned up pretty well, at least on the outside. It was pretty dirty. You know, the inside really wasn't that bad. And that concerns me. I don't know why this carb wouldn't run. I mean, granted, there was a bit of debris in the bowl, so potentially there was a little bit strategically wedged into the main jet, although I didn't see that. So we might have a bigger problem with the carb. Hopefully the ultrasonic took care of it. And after pulling it out of the ultrasonic, I rinsed it with water, blew it dry, and I noticed another issue which could for sure cause this carb to run lean, kind of like we were seeing. I don't think quite as bad, but the throttle, what I noticed is that the shaft, right where it goes into the carb body, you know, if I move it back and forth, you can see there is play there. So that is actually a vacuum leak. So it's gonna draw air actually through there, unmetered air, and suck it into the engine, and the engine's gonna run lean. And in a scenario like that, you might need to add a bit of choke to stop 
the engine from surging. You know, in our case, we were at full choke and it still wouldn't run. So I'm hoping that that is not the issue because if it is, we most likely need a new carb. So let's just get this back together and see if it's running the way that it should. Let's try it out. Yeah. This little spring here, it's pretty important. It takes out the slop between the governor rod and the carburetor and also on the other side where this rod connects to the governor arm because there is going to be some clearance. You can actually kind of wiggle it back and forth. And with that there, that can actually cause the governor to oscillate. And without the spring, the engine may surge, even though there's nothing wrong with your carburetor. Always make sure that throttle plate is not bound up. It's a good idea to check that really on a generator that has been sitting for a long time because the resting position is full open throttle. And if a carb gets a little crusty and that throttle plate gets stuck or rusted in place, when the engine starts, the governor is going to try to push that throttle closed. And if it can't move, then the engine is going to run very fast. Anyway, we'll get the air box on. I'm going to leave the filter off for now. And I also ran this through the ultrasonic. It was pretty messy. I took a second and just put the end cover back on the power head since I think we're done in there. And I've also fueled up the carb, so that is ready to go. So I'm gonna choke it. We'll start it, and with any luck, we can turn that choke off without the engine stalling. And I've also got these lights reconnected just to keep an eye on the power output. Perfect. The engine, it started right up and I was able to turn that choke off within about a second and the engine kept running and it ran smooth. So I think we're pretty much done on this one. I just need to get the air box back together. The air filter that was in there originally was pretty bad. 
So I'm gonna throw a new one in there and we'll just clean up this dust real quick and then we'll roll it outside, put it under load and see how it performs. So that was the filter that came in this machine. So we're gonna swap that out with a brand new one. I thought I was done and I was just getting ready to reconnect this fuel line here. And then I noticed the rubber bushing that's right there that holds the fuel valve into the fuel tank and also prevents it from leaking has failed. There is a big crack right there. So yeah, that's no good. If I put fuel in the tank, it's gonna pour right out onto the floor. So the tank does need to be pulled. We'll flip it over get that bad bushing out of there and put a new one in its place. Now you really need to use a brush like this on a textured tank or else you'll never get the dirt out on the low points. Both of those are pretty loose. In theory, this should come out pretty easily since we have most of the bushing already. Uh, there is still a bit holding this in and most likely it's gonna drop into the tank, which is fine, we'll just fish that out later. I'm surprised it's holding on so tight. I thought it would come right out. go. I picked up these a while ago. This was a six pack of bushings from HIPAA, 33 60 fourths. And when I first started repairing generators, I didn't know that these were standard. I mean, every plastic tank that I've ever had to replace a bushing on, this has fit. And that's a good thing, because if you actually go to a parts site and look up the parts for the machine you're working on, a lot of times it'll say this part's discontinued. What they don't tell you is that it's a common part and any will do for the most part. So since this fits, we can get this installed. I'm just gonna remove this fuel line and you actually need to install this just up to the taper and no further. So once you install it like that, you insert it into the hole and then you send it the rest of the way home. And that can be a bit tricky, especially with the plastic tank. I'm always afraid I'm gonna break it. So just keep that in mind when pushing down. You don't wanna break the tank. I'm not sure it really matters which way we go. 
the carb fitting is actually directly below here. And no matter what I do, we're going to have to bend it back at least 180 degrees to connect to the carburetor. So I'm thinking something like that will do. I'm just going to use a bit of oil. It doesn't have to be oil, but you do want to use something to help the install. It is a very tight fit. And if you don't use any oil, yeah, you're most likely not going to be successful. Yeah, right to there should be fine. Put some more oil here. This is going to be the tough area since it's tapered above where that bushing is now. Okay, good. So that's the easy part. And now you just got to push down until this piece fully seats and it'll make a nice snug fit and hopefully not leak any fuel. So the idea, at least the way I do it, is I just push down real hard and kind of rotate it back and forth. And that usually helps it go in. There we go. It really is kind of odd that they exited that way from the tank because the carb is right there. So we're going completely the wrong way. And the line I cut off was what appears to be a formed line. Either that or it just got petrified in this shape. So like this, it connected fine, made a tight corner, and then it dropped down onto the fitting for the carburetor. And unfortunately, I don't have that luxury. I just have standard fuel line. And if I connect that to there and make a tight bend, you know, 180 degree bend, that fuel line begins to collapse. And there's also a lot of spring tension pushing it back down. And right below there is the governor linkage. So that could interfere with that as well. So rather than trying to make a a 180 and then a 90 down onto the carb. I think it makes a lot more sense to just turn that like this. That way it comes out. You go down 90 degrees and connect right to the carburetor. So unless I'm missing something, that's the way I'm going to go. I just put the bolts back in the tank so it's exactly in the right spot. Before I cut that fuel line, I want to make sure things are positioned where they're going to be.
Well, there's really not much more to do on this except load test it. However, before I do that, I might check out this one as well in this video. This is a storm responder generator, and it actually has a good running engine. There's no oil sensor. This one hasn't run out of oil yet, but it's not making power. And the power head that's on there is identical, more or less, to what's on there. We have the same brush bridge rectifier assembly, and I'm willing to bet the problem that happened here is what's going on here. So I'm not going to take you through the detail on this one, but I will show you the highlights, and maybe by the end of this video we'll have two generators that are now making power that had the same problem. So let's get this one out of the car and take a look. Just check the oil real quick. This one does not have the oil sensor. Yeah, plenty of oil. Looks nice and clean, so should be safe to start. Let's give this a try. Same test as last time. I've got both these lights turned on, each one plugged into a different leg. We'll just get it started, see if we have any output from this generator. Pretty much the same story. No output on either leg. So I'm thinking we have another bad bridge rectifier. Now normally when generators don't make power, I say don't get your hopes up. Most of the time it's a bad power head. These though, they're very robust. It's usually a bad bridge rectifier and issues with the residual magnetism. So I do have, I think, another set of brushes I can use. Not that one. This is the one I just pulled off the other machine that is definitely bad. And this one I repaired previously. I wouldn't say it's the best repair. You can see some burn marks where I kind of reattached the good diodes. Uh, but this does test well, so I think it'll be good enough to at least test with. And if we can get this machine to make power, I'll just order a new part. So for now, I'm going to get the end cap off. We'll get those brushes out, we'll test them real quick, see if the diodes are bad. And if they are, I'm just gonna flash it with a battery, put that repaired set in its place, and see if we can't get some output from this machine. End cap bolts are loose. So I would say the prior owner was definitely in here trying to figure out what was wrong or maybe he knows what's wrong yeah looks very clean in here lacing looks good copper looks good no sign of a meltdown brushes they're installed the right way these screws are loose hopefully they're not stripped Brushes look a little bit odd. Slip rings feel good though. So we're gonna do the same test as before. Negative on either tab should come out on the negative brush. We should see a voltage drop. And we do. No drop on the other, so that is good. We'll check the other tab. Same test, should be a voltage drop here. None there. So we're looking good so far. Let's try the positive. 
to the positive brush. Good. Should be no drop there, and there's not. And finally, the last one. There should be a voltage drop right there and not right there. So this bridge rectifier actually is fine. You know, the brushes, they don't look great. They should have a curve on it, kind of like the ones on the left, whereas these are rounded. So, yeah, I mean, that's not good. They have some wear. They should be replaced. You know, I don't think that would be enough to prevent it from powering up. You know, I say we give these a try anyway, and we can always flash it actually through the bridge rectifier. If the rectifier is working fine, we can just put 12 volts through. The rectifier will send positive and negative to the correct slip rings, and we should get some residual magnetism back. So let's just try these real quick, and if that doesn't work, we'll flash it, see if we get any change. So I've got the brushes reinstalled, actually the ones that I repaired, so they're not the exact same set. And I double-checked the ohms on the DPE winding and the rotor, everything checked out, no shorts to ground. And then I tested the outlets, and what I saw actually was that the top two were getting nothing. The bottom two looked fine, so I pulled the quick disconnect and checked from there, and everything tested well. So I think we do have an issue up here. Maybe there's a loose wire or maybe a bad circuit breaker. I am not sure. So let me, I guess, get you set up in a stand a little better. I'll show you the readings I get there. I'll plug it back in and show you what I'm seeing here. Maybe just flip that circuit breaker on and off and see if that makes any difference. Hopefully you can kind of see this. So we're set to check resistance. The way they wire these is that leg one is diagonal and leg two is diagonal the other way. So we'll just start with one of them. It should be around 0.3 ohms, which were pretty close, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Then we'll check the other leg. We should see the same reading. And we do. So yeah, everything's testing well. I guess we can check it to ground. I didn't do that yet. No connection from one of the legs or the other. So the power head, I would say, is 100% fine. You know, that is not the issue here. It's got to be something to do. Now I'm thinking with this box. So let's just reconnect this and we'll test from the outlets. This is wired a little funny. Most generators, they have, you know, leg one, leg two. Uh, with the storm responders, they have it actually leg one going across the top, leg two on the bottom. So keep that in mind. If you don't know, you can also just use the 240 outlet, which is a little more intuitive because you have the one with the little tab or the notch. That's the ground. Opposite, we have neutral. And then we have leg one and leg two. So let's just test one of these legs. And let's see, I'll hold the multimeter up so you can see. We're actually pretty low, 0.2. Might be okay, it does seem a bit low. Now we're plugged into the other leg and we get nothing. So I think we have a wiring issue. So what I'm gonna do instead is just unplug the quick disconnect. We'll put the probes in directly on the stator output on one of the legs, see what we see. Hopefully it's 120 volts. So we're probed in to one of the legs and you can see from the resistance we have a good connection so I'm going to switch that over just to measure volts AC and let's start the engine see if we get something of value here.
Yeah, it's still no output from this machine, so I'm leaning towards a loss of magnetism combined with whatever funny business is going on in that control panel. So I'm going to leave that wire disconnected from the control panel. I'm just going to flash it with 12 volts to the brushes, and we'll try it one more time. So I know you can't see it, but I've got these wires going to that same 5 amp fuse and connected to the battery. So I'm just going to touch it to the post. And actually, I'm not getting any sparks. So we're not actually making a connection for some reason. Hmm. Let me double check these leads, see if they're any good. I'm not getting anything. These test leads that I just used were good. No floor current through here. And there should be. So let me get out that other set of brushes I used last time. See if uh, that works any better. And just to show you, with this set of brushes on there, we are connected to this meter to measure the resistance. And we're at about 50 ohms, uh, which is fine. That is a decent connection, so now we should be able to flash it. Put that there. And tap this over here. Yeah, now we get a nice spark. So we are sending power in for sure. Let the wires cool down a bit. I need to get better test leads. Although this is only about half an amp at 12 volts, so should be fine. All right, good enough. I'm going to go back to the original set of brushes that came on this machine. And yeah, I'm not sure why I couldn't flash it through here unless I did a bad repair. And I tested it after I repaired it. Granted, that was months ago, so maybe, yeah, maybe these aren't so good anymore. So, yeah, we'll get the originals back on there. And we'll try this again. Very nice, we've got power. So flashing the field, I think, is all it needed. Why? I don't know. Usually they don't lose magnetism unless the bridge rectifier goes out. So I don't know if that's the original part. You know, it looks quite worn, so I don't think it was replaced unless the previous owner just happened to have another one hanging around that he threw in there. And as we saw on the other machine, once the rectifier fails, the rotor becomes scrambled as far as the residual goes. Anyway, we do have power and I know we do have some wiring issues. So that might be related to what happened down there. I am not sure, you know, I kind of doubt it, but I don't want to plug in that harness until we open that panel up and just see exactly what's going on in there. So it is a few days later and I ordered a new set of brushes from Amazon. They got here pretty quick, so I say we start there. Get these brushes installed and then move on to that control panel to see where the fault is there. It is pretty dirty in here. And I don't like using compressed air to clean this up. So those little bits of debris get wedged between the rotor and the stator. 
And, you know, I don't know if it's going to cause an issue, but it could. And this dirt really isn't going to hurt anything unless it gets sucked in there. So if we just brush the chunks out, it should minimize the chance of any damage, I think. So I left the wires unplugged. There's only four nuts holding this control panel in place. Two on the bottom, two on the top. Uh, the two on the top though, you cannot get to with the tank. It is in the way. So this tank is actually quite full. I'm just gonna remove the bolts holding the tank in. We'll prop the tank up a bit just to get the clearance we need so that this control panel can come out. Like the rest of this machine, this thing is pretty filthy. Aha. Uh -huh. Wow. We do have a loose wire and we have a jerry rigged wire that goes God only knows where. Oh, it goes nowhere. Anyway, this is an easy fix. We just remove that, plug this in. And it should be fixed. Let's double check it. So for this test, I'm gonna use the multimeter set to check in continuity mode, which basically means it'll beep if there's a low ohm connection, which means there's a good connection. And that's what we wanna check for here. So on the back of this box, we have five pins. And I don't know exactly which pin is which, other than the one right there is the ground. Then we have leg one, bottom left to top right, leg two, bottom right to top left. Now, which one's the neutral pin? Which one's the live pin? I don't know. So that's what we're gonna find out. So to do this test, I'm just gonna insert one lead in any neutral here on the front of the box. So I'm gonna use this one right here on the 240. And actually we'll turn that switch to on. Although it shouldn't matter, the neutral wires don't go through the circuit breaker. But we just wanna make sure we don't have a connection where we shouldn't. So let's just start. So we have a neutral on the top left, top right, nothing on the bottom right. We have one here on the ground, so this is neutral bonded, and nothing on the left. So that looks okay. You know, as a double check that there's no funny business here, let's just check the front. We'll check leg one and leg two. There should be no connection. And there's not on that plug. Let's just check the live wires here.
and no connection. So that is good. And then if we check, of course, the ground, we get a connection. Neutral, ground, neutral, ground, neutral, ground, neutral, ground. So all the neutrals and the grounds, they all check out. So let's move to one of the legs. And let's just check on the front which leg corresponds over here. Uh, like I said, leg one runs across the top, leg two on the bottom. So we got nothing on the bottom, but we have a connection on the top. So that is good. Let's just double check the ground and neutral, nothing there. We'll check the other leg and we should see the opposite. So no connection on the top, but we have a connection on both the bottom. Then if we flip around to the back, the live should be one of these bottom pins. So it looks like it's the bottom left and not the right. So if we swap this, it should have moved to the right. And it did. And of course, no other connections anywhere else. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with this. I'm not sure why someone unplugged the wire and just had a free wire floating around connecting to one of the legs. That could have been bad. But in this case, I think we're okay. So I'm going to put it back together. Of course, we'll test with it. You know, potentially there's an issue with the circuit breaker tripping and maybe they were just trying to bypass the circuit breaker. Not sure because they didn't actually bypass it. So yeah, very odd. I've just been spending a ton of time kind of cleaning this thing up. It was quite a mess. And I'm also swapping out the fuel. You know, this stuff isn't bad. You know, I'm not sure how old it is. So I think we'll start with some fresh fuel. And I'm also going to change the oil. Again, oil didn't look terrible, but it's better to be safe than sorry. Yeah, looks brand new. Not a bad payoff. Almost six gallons of fuel came out of that tank. Uh, anyway, I was getting ready to reconnect this fuel line and I noticed we have the same problem with the bushing as the other. Not quite as bad, but there is a crack right there and I think I see another one kind of around the corner. So yeah, same procedure as last time. I'm not gonna show you it twice. So I'm gonna swap that out and I'll meet you outside in a minute. There we go.
Just soap and water. It's the moment of truth, and I'm gonna start by testing the storm responder generator. This one I did put fuel in the tank. Hopefully it's enough to test with, and it's actually been a few days, and things are nice and dry. So we'll just get the fuel valve turned on, the choke, the ignition, and the plan is really just to start it, like we always do, and while it's warming up, we'll double check the outputs. We'll see what the voltage, the hertz, the distortion, and see what that sine wave looks like. Now this generator does not have an AVR so without a load we're going to be at around 130 volts and under a full load that's going to come down by about 20 volts. So that's what I'm expecting to see here and I have tested these power heads before. You know despite not having an AVR the harmonic distortion actually is lower than most generators kind of of this class. So be interested to see how this one performs given we had some power issues. So let's get it started and see what we get.
You know, I'm always tempted to recommend this generator to people. I really do like it. You know, if it had an oil sensor, I think that would make the difference. Unfortunately, it doesn't have one, and that's usually what kills these machines. Anyway, it had no issues at all handling an overload of 6,000 watts. The engine was holding at 58.7 hertz, so there was plenty of horsepower to spare. Now, the voltage, well, that's a different story. Without the AVR, we saw quite a swing. We started at 129 volts with no load, and under 6,000 watts, that came down by about 18 volts to 111 volts. So that is, I guess, the downside of not having an AVR. And the distortion surprisingly didn't change a whole lot from no load to 3,000 watts at about 8 or 9%. And then from 5,000 watts to 6,000, we went from like 12% to 14%. So it is high. That said, it's actually lower than most. So yeah, not too bad. Anyway, let's roll this one out of the way. We'll bring Kyle's out and see how that one does. Rinse and repeat. Pretty much the same test here, except this time I'm not going to bring it up to 6,000 watts. I'm only going to do 3,000 because this machine is only rated at 3,550 watts. So we'll be pretty close to the max, about 90%. Just see how it does and call it done. Just like its big brother, this one did pretty well. No issues at all to report with the engine. Without a load, we're at 61 and a half hertz, and under 3,000 watts, it was holding just below 59 hertz. The distortion was actually a little better on this one. We started at 7% harmonic distortion. With the 1,500 watt load on, it came up just a bit, but it was still below 8% which is pretty good. And then under 3,000 watts, it came up higher to 11%, which compared to a lot of other machines is very good. As far as the voltage goes, well, yeah, that's kind of the same story here. There is no AVR, so from no load to full load, there is about a 20 volt swing. And in this case, we saw closer to a 15 volt swing. Without a load, we were close to 127 volts. And under load, I think it was around 112 volts, under a 3,000 watt load. So yeah, not ideal, 
But that's kind of the nature of the beast with this one. There's really not a whole lot you can do. Anyway, both of these generators, they are now fixed. They had similar-ish issues, but not quite the same. Both had lost magnetism, and most generators made today, that's not going to be an issue. But power heads like this, they do rely on that residual magnetism. And this one is a clear-cut case. The diodes had gone bad, it sent AC into the rotor, and it scrambled that residual magnetism. Now, this one over here, I am really not sure what caused it to lose magnetism. I mean, someone was definitely in there doing stuff they shouldn't. The brushes, they looked damaged and not broken. I think someone actually filed those brushes the way that they were. You know, the bridge rectifier wasn't bad. And of course we had that mystery wire inside the control panel. So somebody did something, whether that caused the loss of magnetism, it's really hard to say. So, you know, besides a bad bridge rectifier, the other thing that can cause a loss of magnetism is just sitting around for a long time or potentially shutting it down with a heavy load on the machine. That can also damage or remove the residual magnetism, and that may have been the case here. Anyway, these were both easy fixes. Like I say, usually if they don't make power, it's not going to make power. But with a power head like this, I would say more often than not, it's a loss of magnetism or a bad bridge rectifier or both. Anyway, I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.